welcome on this rainy day. It's wonderful to see so many people. Uh, in, in the green room, somebody said, about World War I? As if World War I had been forgotten. And it is often uh, something of a forgotten subject in uh, the academy uh, but, uh, and in public remembrance. But it is certainly not a forgotten subject here at the Evo Institute or at the Leo Beck Institute. And today's program is one of several that we will be uh, putting on over the course of the next year or two, having to do with various aspects of World War I, the Russian Revolution, and the Jewish world. The previous um, uh, uh, lecture that we had was by Richard Pipes. Uh, and forthcoming will be uh, a, a course given by Stephen Zipperstein, who is the Jacob Cronhill Visiting Scholar at the Evo Institute, who will be here until June of this year. And we will have other um, classes and, and public lectures uh, in the future, and I invite all of you uh, to go and, and visit the Evo uh, table uh, for information about these, these events. Uh, I want to thank in particular uh, Frank Mecklenburg and the Leo Beck Institute for making this possible. Today's program really developed out of conversations that uh, I had with Frank uh, that were vague and, and, and somewhat uh, abstract and Frank uh, gave it shape and uh, I'm delighted by our distinguished panel today. Uh, Lionel Trilling once said <clears throat> that most of English history is a study of snobbery. And I think it was purposely exaggerated uh, to make a point. But English class snobbery has an equivalent in the Jewish world, which is largely the snobbery that uh, most of us uh, of East European backgrounds experienced at the hands of our German cousins. Uh, either in country clubs or uh, in universities or uh, in, in, in just uh, daily social life. At least that's what I grew up with. Uh, today's program is an attempt at, at understanding this uh, conflict that many of us have experienced firsthand and showing that it had particular roots in history and had particular relevance uh, to uh, what happened during World War I. Um, and with that, I will hand the podium over to Frank Mecklenburg to introduce the rest of our program. Thank you very much. My name is Frank Mecklenburg. I'm the research director of Leo Beck Institute. And uh, we are very excited uh, about uh, the upcoming programs and to work very closely with YIVO, but also with the American Jewish Historical Society. And we thought that um, sort of to at the start of this uh, four year uh, uh, period of commemoration, um, we should have something that really includes all the uh, important players in this, um, meaning uh, when we talk about the Jews in World War I. And um, the American side is very often uh, sort of forgotten, certainly in Europe, uh, where they still don't understand the role that American Jewry played in all of this, and we will hear about this later. Um, I want to emphasize what Jonathan was saying. Uh, we are very happy uh, that uh, Leo Beck Institute and uh, Evo are uh, collaborating on these topics, and um, the whole issue of uh, the Jews um, at the turn of the century and into World War I and after, uh, which is the, the topic of, of this afternoon, uh, is something that has been prevented from really being looked into uh, for various reasons. And the main reason is um, the Cold War. Uh, East-West is sort of like the, 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 the symbol for all of this. And in the 21st century, uh, we really don't have these issues any longer. So it is also important to make clear that this is really a historical phase that we are talking about. And for everybody uh, I see 
in the room, we are all 20th century people. Uh, for us, East and West was like it was uh, heaven and earth or something like this, but it's not. Uh, and, and, and so this debate will make clear, uh, I hope that uh, this is a concept that developed. And um, so when in uh, the early 90s, um, the debate uh, started to form a center for Jewish history, it was Leo Beck Institute, YIVO, and the American Jewish Historical Society to come together in one place, and here we are at the Center for Jewish History, and we are very excited. And I just want to mention also one of the programs um, that by way of Leo Beck Institute is coming uh, on April 9th. We have a program about the, the field rabbis in World War I, um, which is also a topic that um, has uh, found very little uh, historiography so far, and we are introducing a book that is mainly uh, translations for the first time in, in the English language, translations of memoirs, letters, speeches, and so that everybody can get a much better sense of that detail, but which is very crucial. And so let me introduce to you the moderator of t uh, this afternoon's panel, uh, Professor Anson Rabenbach, who will introduce the panel. Thank you. Okay. I think it would be good if the panelists came up and took their seats, and then I'll be able to introduce them with their, so you can see them, I think is a good idea. This afternoon's discussion, as you know, is occasioned by the 100th anniversary of the beginning of the First World War on July 28, 1914. Anniversaries are a mixed bag. On the plus side, there is new scholarship, new attention to events or uh, circumstances, situations, themes which have been ignored. And Frank rightly mentioned that the question of East, West, Eastern Jews, Western Jews, and the war is one of those neglected topics. There are also new books, new scholarship, sometimes even uh, methodologies which we had dismissed or forgotten or for a long time were considered obsolete, like diplomatic history, for example, have come back into vogue as a result of the anniversary. I mentioned, just in case you don't know it, Christopher Clark's The Sleepwalkers, which is a reevaluation of the beginnings, the origins of the war, when many of us, when we were uh, students, were told that the question of the origins of the First World War is settled, no more discussion uh, about that topic, Clark has a new take. Um, I'll tell you what it is. He thinks that, he, he, he says, it's not an Agatha Christie mystery. It's not who is holding the smoking gun. Everybody had a gun. And that's the important thing to remember. Now, we have brought together these notable scholars, distinguished scholars of Jewish history, intellectual history, of the era of the First World War, to engage in a discussion, a conversation, about the political, social, and cultural encounters that the war brought into existence. So let me begin by raising a few questions, which I hope we can discuss. And of course, you're welcome to discuss um, whatever you like. Uh, I also will introduce the panelists in a moment. Let me begin with the questions, though. Our main theme, of course, is how the war altered the political and social encounter between Eastern and Western Jews. How did this encounter transform identities, perceptions? How did the divide between Eastern and Western Jews change or didn't change as a result of the war. We might imagine a few dimensions. First, Jews as combatants. Jews served in all of the armies of the Entente and of the Central Powers in numbers roughly proportional 
to those of their non-Jewish compatriots. They served at all ranks. There were Jewish generals and there were Jewish privates. Two million Jews were in uniform and an estimated 170,000 were killed of 16 million roughly total dead. The notorious Jew count, the count of the number of Jews in the military that was occasioned by German anti-Semites in 1916, came to the result or proved that Jewish losses were roughly the same as general losses. Secondly, Jews as combatants, as non-combatants, sorry, Jewish civilians were affected by the war virtually everywhere. But in Eastern Europe, the front quickly swamped the areas of Jewish settlement from Lithuania to Odessa, from Poland to Ukraine to Western Russia. Brutal warfare and terrifying mechanized assaults created hundreds of thousands of refugees who were suddenly drawn into the conflagration. Wartime pogroms dwarfed those of Eastern Europe a decade earlier. Contemporaries estimated, and I, again, again, these figures are barely what you might call reliable, contemporaries estimate that a quarter of a million Jews perished in the retreat of the Russian army in 1915. During the Polish-Ukrainian fighting in 1918, the city, the Jewish section of Lvov, was almost entirely destroyed. That brings us to the question of how we should think about international assistance, philanthropy, charity. The catastrophic situation created an urgent need for a new transnational Jewish-oriented philanthropy. American organizations responded to the crisis, and the question is, how did they respond? How were they able to respond? In what ways did they respond? The most important relief effort, as you probably know, was organized by the American Joint Distribution Committee, called the Joint, which was founded in 1914 at the beginning of the war, and which provided food and medical supplies well into the post-war era. We also might think about the role of Jews as the beneficiaries of the charity efforts of Herbert Hoover and the Hoover Organization Relief Initiative in 1919. Then there is the question of how Western Jews perceived Eastern Jews and vice versa. There was a contact here that hadn't occurred before. Jewish soldiers, German Jewish soldiers, Austrian Jewish soldiers occupied uh, areas of Jewish, of Eastern Jewish settlement. How did the war impact on traditional cultural attitudes and prejudices? Did the war dramatically alter the image, the, the image of Eastern Jews, especially among German and Austrian Jews? Did this encounter strengthen or weaken pre-war attitudes? Did the authenticity of Eastern Jews as spiritually superior view of people like, famous people like Martin Buber or Gershom Sholem, contribute to the famous cult of the authenticity of Eastern, uh, of Eastern Jews among German Jews? Or did it bring some German Jews closer to their anti-Semitic countrymen? Did it intensify the identification of the official German Jews with their anti-Semitic contemporaries? Did the war turn Eastern Jews, and this is a quote from Stephen Ashheim, did the war turn the Eastern Jews into a problem for the Western Jews? Simply put, were Eastern Jews proof positive that Jews, however assimilated, did not belong to the nation? Then there is the question of Zionism. What was the impact of the war on Zionism? Did the war intensify the liberal and orthodox German-Jewish divide over whether or not Yiddish or German was the language of the Jews? Or whether Jewishness is a religious, a cultural, a national phenomenon? How did Zionism, especially German-Jewish Zionism, respond to the refugee crisis? Did 
the Balfour Declaration, the declaration that declared Palestine a mandate of the British Empire or a mandate of Jewish settlement for the uh, British Empire affect the perception of Eastern and Western Jews differently. Then there was the post-war issue. How did the occupation of Eastern Europe by the Central Powers, Germany, Austria, Poland, and Russia, affect Jewish inhabitants? What was the impact of the post-war situation on the successor states in the wake of the collapse of virtually all of the European continental empires? Prussia, Habsburg Empire, the Tsarist Empire, the Ottoman Empire, all disintegrated into small states. What was the response of Jewish organizations and Jews to the breakup of the empires? Another result, post-war result of the war was the massive population transfers, immigrations, and shifts in population and borders of Jews throughout Europe. Popular protests and policies to restrict immigration, including in the United States, was one response of states to the existence of these Jewish populations. How did the war change or alter the perceptions of Jews on the part of policymakers and Jewish communities? Finally, how did the Great War, and this is, I think, a very difficult question, how did the Great War impact Jewish memory? Did the war create, for example, something analogous to what Paul Fussell in a very famous book described as uh, the Great War in modern memory, a kind of war-induced, war-weary modernity, a moral irony, as Fussell calls it? Or was this a particularly British literary sensibility that did not cross over to the continent? Did the catastrophic events of 1914 to 18 not already foreshadow other later genocides, industrial mass slaughter as the prelude to industrial mass murder? Now, let me just introduce our participants very briefly. Stephen Ashheim, character here, um, Professor Emeritus at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, and currently a fellow of the Strauss Institute for Advanced Study of Law and Justice at New York University. He's written many books, most recently Beyond the Border, The German-Jewish Legacy Abroad, Princeton University Press, and more pertinent to this topic, Brothers and Strangers, the Eastern European Jew, East European Jew in German and German Jewish Consciousness, 1800 to 1923. Hasia Diner the Paul, is the Paul S. and Sylvia Steinberg Professor of American Jewish History and Director of the Goldstein Gorin Center of American Jewish History at New York University. Among her many books are We Remember with Reverence and Love, American Jews and the Myth of Silence After the Holocaust, and Jews of the United States, 1654 to 2000. Lastly, David Fishman is professor of Jewish history at the Jewish Theological Seminary, and was also very active in YIVO here, and has written a number of books on our topic including Russia's First Modern Jews, The Jews of Shklov, From Mesopotamia to Modernity, Ten Introductions to Jewish History and Literature, and finally, The Rise of Modern Yiddish Culture. So I invite our participants to begin the discussion. To come up, you say? Whatever you prefer. Whatever you prefer. Does this work? Yes. yes. OK. Uh, my friend Andy, Andy Anson Rabenbach, has asked about 2,000 questions, and we have an hour. So, uh, and he said it's just half the questions. So um, I'm going to be extremely selective. Uh, the, first qu uh, the last point that, that he raised, I'll start with, even though it's not in my purview. And what relationship does this have to Jewish memory? 
Uh, the reason we're having this, I think, as an unusual event is the fact that for obvious reasons, World War II has swamped Jewish memory. And the reasons for this are quite clear. So me Jewish memory of World War I has been, uh, in a sense, diminished, and the reasons for this uh, become quite clear. But if you look at it from the viewpoint of those who experienced World War I, and for those who came to grips or tried to come to grips with what had happened in World War I, the mass slaughter, the cruelty, the dimensions of it, straight after World War I, and increasingly so, there were extreme ruminations about how disastrous this was and how, if you like, the crisis of civilization had come. And this was certainly true in Germany, uh, uh, where, which was both true for Jewish and non-Jewish purposes. Um, without World War I, you do not have the kind of ruminations uh, that Gershom Scholem, for instance, uh, indulged in, or even Franz Rosenzweig. And certainly, on the other side, you don't have Germans like Martin Heidegger and Ernst Junger writing the way they did were it not for the crumbling civilization that people experienced after World War I. That having said, uh, I'm going to limit myself uh, very briefly to the title of the program, which was World War I and the Transformation of East-West Experience. In order to understand the transformation or lack of it, you have to understand what came before it. So I'll put it in extremely graphic, simple form. The rift between Western Jewry and East European Jewry that came long before World War I was fundamentally a result of the fact that in the West and in Central Europe, Jewish emancipation occurred. Eastern Europe, emancipation was a dream still to come true. On the basis of enlightenment and emancipation, German and other Western Jews created a kind of stereotype, a construct, an image that they were modern, cultured, enlightenment, enlightened, as opposed to unemancipated, unfree, Ghetto dwelling, you know, just remember that the word used all the time was ghetto. When we want to be nice, we use the word shtetl, which is warm and fiddler on the roof kind of thing. Then the word was, shtet, was ghetto, which meant backwardness, primitiveness, dirt, behind. This was fundamentally the image with which people came to World War I. There were all kinds of shifts in it, and there were modifications, there's no question. But seeing that we're going to have to rush, let me put it in those simple terms. Then comes World War I. The big transformation right at the beginning is that no longer are you dealing just with images and stereotypes. Instead of, if you like, Jews imagining the ghetto, Germany comes to the ghetto. German and Austrian soldiers come to the ghetto. There is, for the first time, real mass contact in which those images, in which those perceptions are tested, sometimes confirmed, sometimes disconfirmed, reinforced, or whatever. Uh, and it is at that point, at this juncture, that we have to start talking about uh, how World War I changes uh, Jewish experience. Um, how much? I don't know. I can go on. Um, we'll come back to you. You'll come back to me. Okay, great. So maybe, in fact, even though I am going to speak now, it might be, in fact, actually be a third, because the United States plays a very uh, particular role in that, uh, unlike 
uh, west or east, um, first the war is not, uh, does not take place within the United States. So uh, Americans and American Jews are uh, uh, so far uh, removed from the zones of combat. And they have a, a certain comfort and privilege by which they can um, observe and react and participate, but it's a very different experience. And uh, secondly, um, the United States enters the war so late, okay, not until the spring of 1917, so there's this very long lead-in lead time where um, Europe is uh, in, uh, um, engaged in battle, and um, the Jews of the United States, like all Americans, are sitting on the sidelines and debating, you know, what's the right thing for the United States to do? And uh, uh, there's really no, there was no consensus among Americans, okay? And there was certainly no consensus among Jews. And so um, it's a very different experience than living in Germany, okay, or living in uh, uh, Russia or in, in places in which uh, become immediate uh, combatants and where the war is fought. Um, so uh, that uh, makes, again, the American experience um, really very different. Um, we might also, in the context of this um, title, think, though, of American Jewry as uh, maybe between East and West. In a sense, it's obviously the West. Uh, but on the other hand, the vast majority of American Jews are the uh, uh, immigrants themselves and their children from Eastern Europe. So they are the products of the Great Migration from the 1870s, um, which um, a migration which only comes to a halt because of the outbreak of uh, the war. So uh, it's very much an East European population with a small older uh, uh, um, elite, um, which were, was of Central European uh, background. Okay, so of Central European background. So um, let me just make a few um, comments about the war itself and what its meaning was for American Jews vis-a-vis -vis Jews of East, the, Jew, the East and the West. And I'm gonna begin this actually by a quote, and this was a quote that appeared in one of the Yiddish dailies, the Tageblatt, an Orthodox um, daily newspaper published in New York. And um, this is uh, in 1916, so the war is on. The United States is, however, not part of it yet. And it, the uh, editorial said the following. It is important for American Jews to keep in mind that we are the only large Jewish community which is not caught up in the horrible tumult. We are the only part of the Jewish world which is living in peace and tranquility, so we should help, when we are able, the Jews on, um, on the other side of the ocean. So um, this is really the, the theme. That is, uh, the Jews of the United States, uh, through organizations like the Joint, but other organizations as well, uh, and uh, even on the level of uh, families trying to communicate with relatives, uh, on the other side of the ocean and to try to send money to relatives. Uh, so again, you have family, you have um, organizations like the uh, hundreds of Landsmannschaften, uh, as, and then um, on the t kind of top of this um, uh, tier, the, uh, the joint, uh, taking on a role of America, American Jews as the helpers. And in some ways, it's a really nice parallel to the idea of the United States coming in on, uh, you know, at this late date and uh, solving the problem, as it were. And um, I don't know if military historians are going to agree, or European military historians, but in a way tipping the balance uh, uh, in favor of the Allies after these um, years of stalemate. And so American Jews are, like America, uh, playing the role of um, savior. Okay, um, we might also say that they also function in a very American uh, way on two other um, counts um, that, again, help us because one of the questions was how does the war and the confrontation between East and West change uh, uh, during World War I, how does it change, uh, let's call it the course of modern Jewish um, history. And um, so, um, just look at, at two things. So first, um, American Jews very early on, again, before there even, there's even remote talk of the United States entering the war, because the assumption was this is going to be a really quick war. Okay, it's going to be over in six weeks or six months or whatever the um, silly prediction was that obviously didn't come to be. 
American Jewry, however, stepped into the fray right away um, and tried to involve the United States government to be a partner in, um, okay, oh, the United, uh, trying to get the United States government to be a partner uh, to help the Jews of Europe regardless of what side they were on because the United States is um, neutral. And so as early as, um, again, January 1916, um, President Woodrow Wilson declares um, uh, Jewish War Relief Day. Okay, so American Jews through the joint and through other political uh, organizations get Wilson to uh, draw public attention to the specific problems of Jewish war sufferers. And we might think of this as a kind of um, moment in time in which uh, American Jewry, using its political clout at home, tries to get the United States government to be an advocate for the Jews. Okay, um, the second uh, long-term implication of this is that the uh, um, Landsmannschaften, okay, as well then as the joint, uh, when they give, when they collect this vast amount of money for um, the Jews uh, who are suffer for the Jewish war sufferers, they're not interested in just giving money per se or money, giving the money pure and simple, but they want to impose upon particularly East European Jewry, going to be the recipients of this of American largesse, they want to impose upon them order, bureaucracy, they want to impose upon them, we might say, American progressive principles of philanthropy. Okay, it's not just coming in and giving the money, but they wanted to see the reorganization of Jewish life in Eastern Europe uh, by, uh, as the, uh, one might say, the strings that were attached to the money. Okay, and so that um, American Jews, vis-a-vis -vis the uh, Jews of uh, Eastern Europe, who are to be the primary uh, recipients of this aid, uh, are to be transformed into something that makes them look a whole lot more modern, okay, and a whole lot more American. Okay, so that they want to recreate uh, East European Jewry in American terms, which leads to, I'm going to say, my, my third and final point about this, um, uh, again, not wanting to go on uh, for, um, for, for too long, that for many of the uh, uh, individuals who are involved in uh, war relief, again, particularly through the Landsmannschaften, those who, saw, and by the way, many of the Landsmannschaften actually sent delegations back to um, their hometowns to try to give out the money. And again, it was very literal uh, that they bring the money there and say, okay, if you want the money, you have to do this, that, and the other. And um, so for those who actually went there, for the members who didn't uh, go, most of whom didn't go, but got to hear speeches about it, got to hear the re uh, read the reports in the Landsmannschaft uh, bulletins, um, what they demonstrated to themselves was how American they had become. That the people back home who were there, sometimes literal, and if not literal, then certainly figurative um, uh, sisters and brothers, uh, were not yet, were not American, and um, it convinced, uh, or it kind of uh, it informed uh, the uh, um, East European Jews living in the United States that even though they had come from Eastern Europe 10 years, 20 years, 30 years earlier, they had really become American. Uh, East European Jewry is uh, first of all the largest Jewry in the world on the eve of, of World War I. There are five and a half million Jews in the Russian Empire and they happen to be living on the battlefield. The front goes back and forth literally over their homes. Uh, I want to stress sort of in my remarks the paradoxical nature of World War I for East European Jewry. The negative side of the ledger is the easy part to tell about. It's sort of what you expect about war. And yet the positive side of the ledger is surprising and often overlooked. Uh, the negative side of the ledger is where to begin. I sort of already began. Uh, the Russians, uh, Tsarist Russia, by the eve of World War I, had a full-fledged state anti-Semitic ideology. It's coming right after the heels of the Bayless trial, blood libel trial, and they react to the war simply with the assumption that all Jews are spies for the Germans, 
There's massive expulsion of Jews from the uh, northwestern part of the Russian Empire, Lithuania. Hundreds of thousands of refugees literally expelled from their homes. Uh, the Yiddish and Hebrew press in the Russian Empire are banned, and there are no Yiddish or Hebrew newspapers or magazines in uh, Russia from 1915 to 1917. Uh, Jews are uh, pariahs. Uh, in the eyes of the Russian army. Things are, oh, uh, as far as the incoming German occupation, there's no explicit anti-Semitic ideology with the Germans. Uh, everyone noticed that. But again, the Jews are in the battlefield, and that means their homes are confiscated, they're kicked out of their homes in small towns, their businesses are seized, this is economic devastation for millions of Jews, for millions of Jews. Uh, refugees galore. The Jewish population of Warsaw increases from 300,000 to 380,000. In other words, almost 25% of the Jews of Warsaw are refugees fleeing into a city. They are homeless. Uh, they are without food. I'll give you just a couple more just to talk about the devastation. Uh, in a city like Vilna, the Jewish, oh well, in 1916, half of the Jews of Vilna needed relief. In 1917, 85% of the Jews of Vilna are, on, are getting relief. The death rate of the Jews in Vilna doubled from 1913 before the war to 1917. There is disease, there is hunger. Uh, that is the, and it's, none of it is anti-Semitic. Everybody is suffering. Uh, and Jews along with everybody. The positive side of the ledger is the German occupation, paradoxically. The German, uh, everyone uh, sensed when the Germans came in that anti-Semitism would not be countenanced. There are no pogroms where the Germans have firm control. There are no blood libels where the Germans have firm control. In fact, the Germans, are a bit less brutal towards the Jews, if only for the fact that they can communicate with them, because Yiddish and German are similar. And some Jews get uh, you know, office jobs working for the German uh, military. More important, Jews are allowed to organize. The Yiddish press, which is banned in Russia, can flourish under the German occupation. The Zionist movement, which was basically suppressed not outlawed totally, but suppressed under the czar, uh, now can meet, uh, have conferences, and uh, there is a sense of excitement and dynamism. Yiddish schools, which were outlawed under the Russians, now can be created. There, uh, and uh, then, in the middle of the war, the two most hopeful events in Jewish history, as seen from that perspective, uh, in 1917, both of them. That is, for Zionists, the Balfour Declaration, mm -hmm. and for both socialists and other diaspora nationalists, uh, the Russian Revolution. The Russian Revolution, which means talk about Jewish national rights, Jewish autonomy, and this energizes East European Jews, also the Jews under the German occupation. Uh, there is hope, and there is activity. So, it, it, it actually, in many ways, uh, some people look back at the German occupation of Eastern Europe, those three and a half years, less than three and a half years, 15 to 18, as actually better than the Russians that came before, and maybe even better than the Poles who came afterwards. Um, however, I'll end on a rather depressing coda. The worst was yet to come, and immediately yet to come, because 1919, Technically, World War I is over, right? The Paris Peace Conference starts in January. The Versailles Treaty is uh, signed in June. 1919 is the bloodiest year of Jewish history to that point. Uh, thousands of Jews are killed in pogroms in Poland, and tens of thousands of Jews are killed in pogroms in Ukraine. Uh, that's not technically part of World War I, but, it's the, uh, but for East European Jews, left, World War I continues at least till 1920. Um, so it's a very mixed uh, ledger, what is World War I for Jews in Eastern Europe. Thank you.
I just want to mention some. Can you hear me? Is this working? This working? No. Yes? I just want to mention something that really touches on uh, all three comments uh, on the American role on the German occupation and on what Stephen said about enlightenment. It's interesting that when you think about the German occupation of Eastern Europe and you think about enlightenment, you have this I suppose you imagine that the Germans came into Eastern Europe and they immediately set up seminars on Kant, Fichte, and Hegel. But this is not the case. There was a kind of an American dimension to the German occupation. Jay Winter, who's one of the leading historians of the First World War, has a photograph, has shown a photograph, which I think comes from here, from the Leo Beck Institute, which shows a uh, traditionally garbed Eastern European Jews lining up in front of a tent. What are they doing? They're going to the movies. It's a field cinema. The Germans set it up, and the film that's showing, it's very clear, it says Charlie Chaplin. So there is this way that the German occupation is different from what you might expect. Um, and, any other comments? Yes, yeah. before? Um, working? Um, I, I just, I want to kind of, this is a dialogue, so we, okay. we're kind of trying to dialogue. Um, what Hassia said about American Jews applies very much to German Jews. That is to say, all the time, not just German Jews, German occupation as well. Um, Eastern European Jewry, it's a cacophony. It's noise, it's disorganization, it's chaos. In fact, when the German Jews go to the uh, East European Batei Knesset the synagogues, they're appalled. There aren't organs there, there aren't sermons. There's just noise going on. We have to keep this quiet. We have to make order here. And so what you have throughout whether it is, it's also the German occupation, by the way, the German non-Jews, who say, this is complete chaos. We have to get these people organized. Um, anybody who's been to Israel, by the way, knows that that tradition carries on to this day. Um, so uh, on, on one level, uh, that operates both for Jews and for the German occupation. Some of it is not quite so wonderful. Um, uh, but I'll, I'll come to that in a minute. The other thing is, it is absolutely true that the East European Jews before the war and certainly during the war act as a kind of prism by which you define your own identity. So in effect, when you say the American Jews were really demonstrating how American they were, the same applies to when German Jews related to their East European cousins, their Germanness became extremely important to them as a mode of, of identity. Now, just let me say two, three words about uh, uh, what you said I think is absolutely correct. When the Germans came in and occupied Eastern Europe, they were seen as liberators. So uh, what you've said is important so that we get out of our heads a kind of historical leap and assume that the Germans were the same Germans that occupied in 1939. They were seen as liberators, they allowed organization, all of the, these things uh, are absolutely true. What is, what is slightly more complicated is that as time went on, there were shifts, uh, and I don't want to call it an anti-Semitic policy, but quite clearly, the, the gaps between them were enormous. And now this was not helped by German Jewry. In what sense? And if you, if you like, if you listen carefully, you will hear that it had very serious ramifications later on. I'm talking about the Second World War, even to this day. Many German Jews said we have to support the East European Jews 
so that they act as mediators or colonizers of German culture in Eastern Europe. Now, in a way, we are still suffering from this kind of, of attitude, which says, why? And here's the Yiddish. Um, all through the period, Yiddish was seen as an inferior language, as jargon, as a decadent kind of German. Suddenly comes World War I. Ah, Yiddish and German are deeply linked to each other. This is the way in which Yiddish can act as a German agent in colonizing the East. So uh, on one level, this became a deeply problematic issue, but much later. Uh, and of course, then there, when there was actual physical contact, then it wasn't the closeness of Yiddish to German that counted, but it was the misunderstandings that occurred between German and Yiddish. They may seem similar, but on critical things, there were deep misunderstandings. Um, yeah, and just uh, perhaps one, one last uh, uh, point, which needs mentioning, and it's very sad, uh, the economic devastation, the tremendous poverty, the disease. One of the results of that was that as myth and to some degree reality, Eastern European Jewish prostitution was a problem. In fact, as you know, German, soldier, German army organized brothels for their soldiers. Uh, there are horrifying stories of what this poverty brought, but this prostitution became a real problem. But the myth of it is even more important, because in Mein Kampf, one of the things that Hitler brings up is the experience of the East, of what these poor German soldiers had to go through as they were exposed to German, to East European Jewish prostitution. So uh, if there wasn't an anti-Semitic policy directly then, certainly in the post-World War, the myth of what happened on the Eastern Front became part of the anti-Semitic armory. So I want to make one just slight, you know, uh, not rejoinder, but just to, to sort of uh, slightly change, you know. So, the, you know, to compare German Jews and American Jews vis-a-vis -vis their stance towards East European Jews, what's notable is that the American Jews who are really engaging with the East Europeans um, are themselves East Europeans who, uh, again, for 10 years, 15 years, whatever you know, the, uh, the time period, um, have been in the United States. And that, I think, was one of the really dramatic um, uh, realities they had was, um, in a way, that moment where they said, you know, we've actually changed. And we have uh, imbibed the same principles of American progressivism and American decorum and American cost accounting. You know, you don't just give out money, you keep records. And if you, you know, have X amount, you have to let write down where you spent it and, and so on. Um, you know, we've really changed and we've become American. And I think that was really a, a kind of, again, from the point of view of, Amer of American Jewish history, it's very important. And also, um, when we think of something like the joint, which, um, you know, uh, the first time I had heard that phrase, I was a child, but I thought, joint, what does that mean, joint? Well, it was, in fact, a um, combination of three different previous organizations, which had three very different constituencies. And so on one partner, uh, one leg of the stool, as it were, were um, the American Jewish committee types, who were, again, uh, Americans very well established, uh, economically very successful, of, um, Germanic, German background. Uh, their parents uh, had, uh, grandparents had emigrated uh, from uh, German speaking lands. Okay, so they're one part of the joint. And then there's an Orthodox part of the joint, so there's a religious component. And then the third were the, um, so the work, the, the labor groups and, um, the, and the socialists. 
So these three groups, which the, in, in the past, before World War I, would have never had anything to do with each other, had only the most um, vicious and scurrilous comments about the other, found the ability to work together. And so for the Landsmannschaft and, and for the East European Jewish masses uh, in the United States, working through the joint was there saying, hey, we're now part, we're now at the communal table. We're no longer just the sort of great unwashed uh, masses um, who are the recipients of aid. We're now, uh, in fact, um, communal insiders. And it gave them a kind of elan and a sense of um, ability to feel they can press for their issues on matters beyond um, this time period and beyond the concerns uh, that were um, uh, launched by the war. Just one comment, absolutely. Um, but how do you tell an East European Jew from a German Jew? If you think about Posen, very, very quickly from an Ostjuda, you became a Westjuda. In fact, East European Jewish humor does this beautifully. They always tell the story about Moshe Pisch, who goes to Germany and very quickly becomes Mos Moritz Wasserstrahl. He then moves to Paris and becomes Maurice Lefontaine. <laughs> All of this within a very short period. So you know, the yeah, lines, I, I just want to say that when we talk East-West, although there clearly is a difference between emancipated Jewry and pre-emancipated Jewry, the lines are extremely porous and thin and they move in both directions. Right, I would just say that, for example, those people who are involved in the Landsmannschaft, and, I mean, they are assertively East European. They're not trying to um, uh, be something else. Um, you know, they belong to these societies. These are the, um, the major focuses uh, for their social, cultural, financial lives. And so um, they have never, they, they, they it's, it's almost as though going through this experience, this encounter with the suffering of Jewish, uh, of the Jews uh, in Europe, in their hometowns, made them realize, even though I still belong to the Calvario Society, I'm an American now. Okay, I've got two comments, one about identity and one about philanthropy. Uh, identity, of course, the German Jewish soldiers or rabbis that come into Poland, they don't leave a dent on the East European Jewish consciousness. What I'm telling you is, when they meet these German Jewish soldiers or rabbis, they just dismiss them. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm giving you a little bit of pushback. The snobism goes both ways. They just dismiss them as assimilated. They're not gonna tell them how to be Jewish. Uh, uh, so, uh, in fact, they're also a negative uh, model. Uh, because during World War I, there's a tremendous uh, growth of Jewish nationalism in Eastern Europe. And uh, it's been there before, but now it's almost a necessity. In other words, there are all these conflicts. It's not only the Germans versus the Russians, but it's the Poles versus the Ukrainians, the Poles versus the Lithuanians. There are so many little wars and national conflicts, and the most smartest strategy Jews can take in the middle of all these national conflicts, which are not ideological, they are military. The smartest strategy is to take is to say, we're not with the Poles, we're not with the Ukrainians, we're not with the Lithuanians, we are with ourselves. We are Jews, we are a nation, we are a people unto ourselves, and we're not gonna get drawn into your conflicts. We will side with whoever is with us. So the war, strengthens this national strain in Jewish identity, if you want, this anti-assimilatory strain, not as before World War I, you had a strong elite that was saying we are poles of the religion of Moses. That elite is in sharp decline during World War I. It's the nationalist strain that's, so that's how identity is affected. Now if I could have a second comment about philanthropy. Uh, first, let me agree with Hasya. The same thing happens with uh, East European Jews, the recipients of the philanthropy. They have to create their own uh, aid committees, and they do, both local and national, both on the Russian side and on the German side. And lo and behold, for the first time, this, this divided Jewry, East, what could be more divided than East European Jewry? Zionists versus Bundists versus Orthodox 
They had never worked together. They had only fought. World War I, you know, these aid committees, Yekopo in Russian, the Jewish Aid Committee, uh, are the first time that Zionists and Bundists and the Orthodox worked together. I, I think it's time to um, stress the positive. Absolutely right. Very little dent German Jews made on East European consciousness. Um, these people were, in their eyes, assimilated. They were flat. They were bourgeois. They were not. They were not authentic Jews. But the other side of the equation is absolutely crucial. That is to say, through contact, physical contact, going to where East European Jews lived, there was amongst a minority, but it was a very distinguished elite, that there was a fundamental transformation in consciousness and a, a self-criticism by going to East European Jewry these Jews were saying, we are not really Jews. We are assimilated, we are bourgeois, we are inauthentic, we are materialistic, and we miss the whole spiritual um, relevant side of being Jewish. And it's a veritable cult of the East European Jew. This is clear for Zionists, but just let me mention three names. Who are very, very famous, at least should be. Well, at least two are famous. The first is a man called Franz Kafka, who on being exposed to East European Jews, um, he has a wonderful uh, passage in his diary when he says he can't really say mother in German because the word Mutter lacks warmth. The, in Yiddish, the connotation of a mother has so much more warmth and beauty. And then he goes up and says, this is in his letter to his father, part of the discovery of East European Jewry and its importance has to do with the revolt against the Jewish, the German Jewish bourgeois home. Read his letter to his father, in which basically he says, I would go up to the hem of the ghetto Jew and kiss the bottom of his coat. Now that's extreme cultish. It's not just Kafka. It's people like Franz Rosenzweig who are experienced at the war and write to their mother. I can't understand the flatness, the bourgeois nature, the inauthenticity of our being Jews. Come here, see these very poor people steeped in spirituality. So although it's quite clear that Kafka and Rosenzweig come from the German-speaking ambit and culture, part of their own self-consciousness and their own critique is a result of their exposure to East European Jewry. I would just add a point which we haven't mentioned, and that is that in addition to Eastern identified East European Jews or Western identified West European Jews, there were also Universalist Jews. In Eastern Europe, in Warsaw and other cities, there were Jews who were trained in the law, there were Jews who were involved in uh, political we talked about socialism and Zionism. And after the war, or at the very end of the war, Jews were deeply involved in the so-called minorities treaties, the treaties that were developed along with the League of Nations and the Versailles Treaty to protect minorities in the new states of Eastern Europe. And it was Jews who were the pioneers of the human rights aspects, human rights provisions of those treaties. Now, of course, those treaties were not effective. In fact, they were failures, but if you look at people who are forgotten, like Emil Rapoport, or somewhat remembered, like Raphael Lemkin, who invented the word genocide and was involved, deeply involved, in the passage of the Genocide Convention of the United Nations, he was the uh, district attorney, state attorney in Warsaw during World War I. So these universalist Jews also emerged from the war. And if I could add that um, when the Paris Peace um, Conference uh, is called, you know, there's this contingent of American Jews under Louis, Mar Louis Marshall who go there to press for the minority rights and uh, in a way um, picking up on their own experiences in the United States um, in um, civil rights 
and other kinds of um, uh, uh, collaborative projects with other groups, um, recognize it's not just about Jews, it's about you know, trying to protect all minorities and that that's how Jews are going to be protected is when all minorities are going to, to be protected. So they, again, bring a kind of um, an, what was, a, a, at least if not an American vision, an American le a legacy of their American actions. David, can I just ask you to elaborate on a point that you just made about socialism and Zionism? How were the socialist Jews uh, regarded by this new Soviet administration? Well, it's a little off the topic of World War One, but uh, well, 1919, yeah, 1918. no, uh, in in this whirlwind of violence, generally speaking, the Red Army was the army that perpetrated the least pogroms, very few, and there actually were military people who were punished for perpetrating pogroms. Uh, Lenin famously said, "The Jewish bourgeoisie is our enemy," not because he's they're Jewish but because they're bourgeois, the Jewish worker is our brother. So, uh, you know, uh, generally in those years, say 1819, uh, Jews in the Russian realm had only one choice. That is, you know, you couldn't be with the Ukrainians, they were perpetrating pogroms. You couldn't be with the white army, they were perpetrating pogroms. The only alternative left were the Soviets, who you knew would probably confiscate your store and persecute your religion, but they wouldn't kill you. So, um, so generally, uh, you know, Jewish public opinion shifts in 1918, 1919, radically to support the Soviets. Okay, thank you. I think we should open up the discussion to the audience. Uh, how are we going to do this? Okay. You have a microphone? This gentleman right here. Uh, my question is, I think, to Professor Fishman or perhaps Professor Ashheim, uh, regarding East European uh, Hasidic leaders who made it to Vienna and established courts. Uh, is, it, is it documented that the Western influence on their followers and uh, the education uh, the higher education that many of them received, uh, and in general, the liberating influences, uh, is this something uh, that either of you could relate to? Uh, yes, I know what you're talking about. Uh, orthodoxy in Eastern Europe had not really been organized uh, into a party, into a movement, and it's really under the German occupation uh, and under the influence of German field rabbis, uh, two German, that uh, what becomes Agudas Yisrael is founded in Poland and Warsaw in 1916, and uh, they establish a party, a movement with a press, and they and yes, also the Beis Yaakov schools were, fa were founded about the same time for girls are also. In other words, German neo-orthodoxy, particularly the Frankfurt neo-orthodoxy, influences East European orthodoxy during the years of the German occupation in a very important way. So I'm actually only supporting what you're saying. Yes, that, the one part of East European Jewry that was influenced by German Jewry was orthodoxy. Does this work? Yes, it does. I think that one has to consider American Jewry as a much more heterogeneous group and also in terms of the historical framework, because Jews came here from the 17th century, Sephardic Jews, and then German Jews came in 1848. And certainly by the time a large contingent of Eastern European Jews began to come here in, in 1890, there was a separation and one couldn't really talk about a category called American Jewelry. And it was after the first generation 
passed after the second generation of Eastern European Jews were born, you began to get much more movement in the direction of German Jews. But even at that point, there has always been a term that Eastern European Jews refer to German Jews with the term Yeka. Uh, there was a separation, and I'm not sure, and here I can ask you the question, in terms of the giving of aid during World War I, was there a distinction between the two categories and or the more heterogeneous groups within both categories? Okay, so I mean, I, th I think I get your question and obviously let me know if, 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 if I'm not. Um, so um, yes, I mean, there were these distinctions and they were actually even more finely grained than you offer in as much as um, there were multiple um, places of origin and for some length of time uh, immigrants to the Jewish immigrants to the United States held on to not something called an East European identity but Romanian Lithuanian Ukrainian and uh, so they didn't even ha they didn't have a, um, a, a, a sort of pan-East European uh, sense of who they were, but were broken down by these various categories. But the process by which um, Jews of heterogeneous backgrounds living in, who lived in the United States began to um, uh, walk a road towards constructing themselves as American was a constant ongoing process. And you can look at many phenomena in the 19th century where this Americanness is beginning to uh, uh, obviate or is beginning to uh, blur the kinds of national backgrounds. Um, and so, um, I mean, we can tell, I'll just take one institution because it's what comes to my mind uh, as we sit here, since uh, David is here from the Jewish Theological Seminary of America. So, I mean, here's an institution founded in 1886. Um, it is funded by, German, by Jews whose families had come from uh, uh, German-speaking lands. It's um, undergraduate students in the initial faculty uh, who were very young, actually really young at the time, um, were almost all the children of um, recent arrivals from Eastern Europe, uh, heavily, although not exclusively, Lithuania. Um, the faculty were um, primarily intellectuals of Central European background uh, influenced by uh, Breslau. Uh, the first president is a Sephardi from Italy, Sabata Morais, so that you see institutions like this beginning to uh, function as, shall we say, little Jewish melting pots um, in which the um, previous places of uh, background, the previous places from which they came, were beginning to be subservient to their setting in America. World War I is very interesting for the, and it's not something we talked about uh, today, but about um, there were obviously Jewish, uh, American um, Jews who fought in World War I, and um, the work done by the Jewish Welfare Board, whose papers are here at the American Jewish Historical Society, was in fact directed at trying to level these kinds of uh, divisions and that these young uh, American men, almost all of whom were the children of uh, East European immigrants or themselves had come as kids from Eastern Europe, um, the Jewish Welfare Board was involved in um, creating programs for them to say, you know, it actually doesn't matter where you come from, you're all American and you're all Jews. And so I mean, your question is really important, but the um, process of the shaping of an American, uh, a sense of being American Jews rather than something else has a much more complicated uh, background than just the emergence of a second generation. Thank, thank you very much for that um, very, very interesting conversation. Um, I have a quick point and a question. So the point um, to contextualize Steve Ashheim's uh, discussion of how important it was that Hitler used prostitution uh, as a cudgel against the Jews is to also add that uh, Jewish prostitution was a very, very embarrassing, shameful, uh, well-known phenomenon from the late 19th century up until the Russian Revolution. And Jewish organizations, specifically in England and Germany, tried to fight the traffic in women, as they called it. You might 
people who are interested might want to look at Prostitution and Prejudice by Ed Brus Bristow. But um, my question is more about the home front. Now, David sort of answered this already, but I'm curious from Steve and Hasia, how Jews and also how Jewish, when I say Jews, I mean male and female, how they integrated into civil society as a result of World War I. I'm thinking of how ecstatically German Jews greeted their equality in the first two years of the war uh, when the Kaiser uh, said that there would be freedom in the, in the Burg, in the, um, in the fortress. But I'm also thinking of how Jewish women uh, went in Germany, how they uh, took their organization and sort of uh, let it be under the umbrella of the National Women's Service and how Jewish women served in all kinds of social welfare organizations. Uh, directing them in locals, in cities, and Jewish men as well, social workers, doctors. So I'm just curious whether um, you can talk a little bit about their integration into civic society and I guess in 1916, Steve, the, the disappointment. Well, um, it's very unusual for academics to, plea, to plead um, ignorance. <laughs> you, you've now met one. Um, Fundamentally, I've never really investigated the question of their integration into kind of uh, civic organizations. It's quite clear, though. Um, although I must say that, uh, put it this way, I'm just talking about organizations that spring up in every camp of German Jewry how to influence and help East European Jews during World War I. You have the KFDO, you have the Hilfsverein, you have the neo-Orthodox, and you have the Zionists. All of them, in a sense, are civil organizations, uh, apart from the fact that, that women are absolutely helping immigrants and refugees, soup kitchens and all that. But it, I, I, the point that I'm, I'm making is that there is a mobilization of German Jews into political spheres which they were not doing before, but in effect, it actually was not the same as American Jewry, but it sharpened the differences between liberals, Zionists, socialists, uh, and the Orthodox, all using different, uh, um, different visions of how East European Jewry should emerge after the war. So I cannot answer the question about integration into civic society. Um, what I do know, of course, and in a way it's deeply understandable, the First World War is greeted as much by German Jews with enthusiasm as virtually the rest of the population. There are one or two exceptions. Um, it's, there's Gustav Landau on the famous debate with Martin Buber, who greeted it with, with great enthusiasm, wonderful for the community, will bring us all together. But there's also Gershom Scholem, and it's very interesting, though, to see that Gershom Scholem opposed entering World War I for the same reason that David talked about. This is not a war for the Jews. This is a war for the Europeans. Let them go and kill themselves. We have other national goals. So, um... That's not my position. Uh, so, um... Obviously, the United States is in the war for so, such a short period of time that it's really hard to talk about uh, any kind of um, significant uh, reorientation of Jewish involvement in civic life, other than to say that um, Jews, the point by which the United States enters the war, Jews were already very integrated into a whole range of uh, um, kind of community institutions that cut across religious lines. And um, I mean, it's interesting that when the United States enters the war, um, the, U, the, the War Department cre uh, turns to the Jewish Welfare Board, which is a newly created institution, to serve the needs of um, Jewish servicemen, and it, they create a structure whereby with, within the context of the, the army, there are three, at least on paper, equal religious institutions, the YMCA, the Knights of Columbus, and the Jewish Welfare Board. 
And obviously, numerically, the Jewish Welfare Board serves a tiny, tiny fraction uh, compared to the Knights of Columbus or the um, uh, um, uh, YMCA. I want to say, though, in terms of the question of uh, women, which actually inspires another, I, something that uh, is worth perhaps even a program here, which is actually there are Jew, American Jews actually play a fairly significant role in opposing the war. Okay, so there's very substantial um, opposition to the war leading up, saying, look, we just should be neutral. Okay, and even after the war, and um, uh, so some people like Emma Goldman, for example, I know she goes to jail because of uh, her opposition to the war. And so there's a very strong anti-war sentiment. I, 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 I'm, I'm not going to say if it was greater or lesser than in um, Germany or England or France, but my guess is it was. And it's because, again, it wasn't fought at home and um, it was easier to take an anti-war position. Many of the anti-war um, Jews, male and female, came out of the socialist uh, movement and play a very important role in trying to keep the United States from entering the war. So they're very much part of the peace movement. Uh, I don't want to repeat myself, but I will develop one point, uh, which is, you know, there's no real civic, civil society in Poland under German occupation. Jews and Poles are separate. But one area of interesting integration which is relevant is the political arena. The Germans in 1916 allow elections to the Warsaw City Council. And for the first time in all of East European Jewish history, the Zionists and other Jewish parties run for the elections as parties for the Warsaw City Council and they get elected. In other words, for the very first time that Jews can participate in general politics with their own parties running for office in a basically democratic framework is 1916 Warsaw. Okay, we have this is a request for a clarification of something you said early in your uh, remarks, and perhaps uh, I just uh, missed your point. Uh, I've been on the impression that ghetto refers to an urban quarter or urban neighborhood for purposes of this talk populated almost exclusively by Jews, and that a shtetl was a more rural village um, populated by it, not exclusively Jews, but mostly Jews. Yeah, um, I'm, you're, you're absolutely right in your strict definition. There's no question. I'm talking here about the way in which myths and stereotypes are, are developed. In order to, and I'm talking now long before World War I, through the course of the 19th century, the way in which the German uh, or Central European Jews built up their self-image was in terms of the negative contrast of um, enlightened Bildungsjuden as opposed to what they called ghetto Jews. Ghetto Jews here is a symbolic construct. It's not literally an urban area. It has to do with an image of the way in which traditional Jews live enclosed, in exclusive, cramped, not really linked to the, to the outside world. That this is a myth and a stereotype, I must make absolutely clear. But the word, they, the, they were not, they didn't really, unless they were particularly well educated, they used the word ghetto. And in many ways, if you look at the, the development over the 19th century, to the degree that German Jews modernized, the East European shtetl, if one calls it that, became a kind of object of anthropological interest. How do these people live? What, is, what are their behavioral patterns? How can we acculturate them? So you're absolutely right in terms of the strict definition, but the way in which it was used was as a construct to contrast one's own identity from a quote unquote lesser identity. Jack, did you have your hand up? I did. Um, I have two comments. One is for Steve and, and one is for David, and I'd like feedback from you if, if you would. 
Steve, first of all, something that you know well but that you didn't have time to discuss in the very, very brief remarks that you made. When you're talking about the transformation of the consciousness of German Jews, you put particular emphasis on the direct encounter with East European Jewry and the ways in which that altered German Jews. There's another part of the experience that is equally important, and that is the significant numbers of German Jewish soldiers who encountered much more pervasive anti-Semitism within the ranks of the German military than they had anticipated, and that this led to a transformation of their own identities. I'm thinking of cases that you know very well, like those of Leo Leuventhal or those of Ernst Simon or any number of other such individuals. This, of course, helps to explain their involvement in and the formation of things like the Lehrhaus, the creation of a German Jewish cultural revival in the 1920s in Frankfurt and, and elsewhere. And, and for David, I agreed 100% with what you were saying about um, the ways in which the German occupation was perceived by East European Jewry. I would add a, a comment, and I'd be interested in your reactions. My sense is that prior to the actual occupation of Eastern Europe by the Nazis in 39, on the level of the rank and file, not on the level of political leadership or the politically engaged, there was a deep misunderstanding. They knew very well that the Nazis were not the same Germans, and yet there were lots of simple East European Jews who were saying, you know, we lived through it last time, we'll live through it again, it was actually not so bad. And this led people who could otherwise potentially have gotten out of the way not to do so. I have nothing to add. You're completely right, Jack. That's another component. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and I'm going to say the same thing. I have nothing to add. You're absolutely right. Okay, we're yes. We, we have time for one more question. Okay. Right. I'm sorry. You've had your hand up for a while. Uh, yes, fo following, following along on the German occupation. Okay. Yeah, but Hitler wasn't Hitler yet. He was just a soldier. Following uh, the subject of the German occupation of uh, Ukraine and part of Poland, I have read that the Jewish privileges and activities under the German occupation, not only clerical, but also buying up grains for export to Germany, which needed food, had exacerbated such anti-Semitism as there was and contributed to the pogroms of 1919. And I read that in one place, which I can't remember the attribution, and I wonder if any of you can follow up on that. I don't understand the question, that the German confiscation of Jewish... No, no that because the Jews were the agents, uh, they were doing the job of collecting the grain, and they were doing the job of writing up things, that this had contributed to the dislike of the Ukrainian peasant. Uh, I don't believe that's the case. Okay. Um, in the Ukraine, of course, it wasn't the Germans, it was the Austrians. It's a yeah. different front. I didn't go into the Austrians yeah. to keep things simpler. Um, but the pogroms had other roots, and the main myth is the myth of Judeo-Bolshevism, that all the Jews uh, support the communist revolution, and the communist revolution is run by Jews, and that by fighting the Jews, you're fighting the communists. So you would scratch out the German occupation. Of course, it's not impossible, as you know, the nature yeah. of anti-Semitism, for people to entertain contradictory myths about the Jews, right? The Jews are the, business, the capitalists, and the Jews are the communists. OK, I'd thank like you. to thank our participants, our panelists, and thank you for your attention. <laughs>